I'm uh, Winslow Hansen. I'm a scientist here at the Cary Institute, and it's my pleasure today to host our seminar speaker, Dr. Kate Hayes. Kate is a NSF postdoctoral fellow. Um, she did her PhD at the um, University of Colorado, Denver, and a bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Kate has been wildly successful with grants, and it reflects the um, the different disciplines that she brings. So she is somebody who um, transcends from paleoecology all the way to field work to using models and the grants that she's gotten reflects that. So in addition to her NSF postdoctoral fellowship, she also came into her postdoc as a co-PI on an NSF grant and is also co-PI on a grant that we submitted to Joint Fire Science Program. And I think that really reflects how integrative of a thinker she is. She really sees how the pieces fit together. And I'm really excited for her to share this talk with you because I think it reflects that systems level thinking. So with that, um, oh, logistics, really quick before I pass it off, sorry, false alarm. Very important. We'd like to welcome our digital audience. Thank you so much for coming. If you'd like to put in the chat where you're calling in from, please do so, and then questions can go in the question and answer portion of the Zoom. All right, with that, I promise I'm done. Take it away. Perfect. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? I'm good on the virtual? Awesome. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Super excited for those of you who have joined online and in person. Um, and thank you, Winslow, for that introduction. I'm Midwestern, so I'm not good about compliments, but I'll try to take that one gracefully. Um, so I'm super excited today to talk about some of the work I've been doing over the last couple of years, trying to understand disturbances and climate change, particularly in Alaska. So we're going to talk a little bit about herbivores, we're going to talk a little bit about fire, um, but one of my main goals for this talk is to really convince you that the boreal forest in particular is a really fascinating ecosystem with which to try to answer and ask some of these really important questions about disturbances and climate change. So we're going to start with a little bit of table setting. The boreal is the largest biome globally. Um, it's a vast, vast ecosystem. And with that vastness comes a lot of heterogeneity. So there's a lot of variety. There's parts of the boreal that are really highly managed. There are parts that are completely unmanaged. Um, but ultimately it's important not only because it's large, but because it stores about 30% of all global terrestrial carbon. So the boreal plays this really critical ecosystem service um, of storing vast, vast amounts of the, the carbon that we have in terrestrial systems. And the key research motivation here is that it's warming really rapidly. Um, so high latitudes in general have warmed about four times faster than the rest of the globe since the year 1979. Alaska is no exception. Um, you'll see in this graph, there's a couple of different ego regions here. I'm gonna be talking mostly today about the interior of Alaska, which is this orange stripe in the middle that's warmed about four degrees Fahrenheit on average since 1969. So for context, that's about twice the rate that we're observing um, in the lower 48 or in the rest of the continental United States. So this is rapid, rapid change. In many ways, the boreal is considered a canary in the cold line. Um, the changes that we might anticipate or expect in other systems with climate change um, are starting to unfold in really dramatic ways here. So this is really one of the big primary reasons um, for all of the really critical research that's happening in this particular region of the world right now. What I'm gonna talk about a lot today is my particular piece of this puzzle, which is working on disturbances. So with this increase in temperature, with this really rapid change, um, has come a change in the frequency, the severity, and the extent of a couple of different disturbances. Um, there's gonna be two I talk about primarily today, biotic disturbances like herbivores and pests and pathogens, and abiotic disturbances like fire. So this is the graph that I've been using um, for my own sanity for the last couple of years in trying to think through all of the different ways that these processes interact um, and combine to alter carbon. Again, because the primary motivation for this is trying to understand what's going to happen to this vast, vast carbon storage under this change in climate and these changes in disturbances. So starting from the top, you have climate, which drives, again, increases in the frequency and the extent um, and severity of disturbances like fire and in biotic agents. Those both have really important impacts on forest structure and forest composition and ultimately forest carbon. So we're gonna start with fire. Um, 
This is a part of the world that historically had what we'd consider an infrequent high severity fire regime. So this is a part of the world that would have would not have burned very frequently, but when it did burn, it would burn in these really high severity, um, completely intense events. So complete canopy mortality, all of the trees dying in an individual fire event. But those fires would occur typically on average about every 100 to 200 years, according to most paleoecological estimates. Um, so this is shifting in, in really dramatic ways. As I said, we're, we're observing increases in fire frequency, in fire severity, and in burned area. This is a map of the uh, Western North American boreal forest system. Again, today I'll talk mostly about the interior of Alaska, which is this dark purple strip up in here. Um, and this inset graph up here on the right, this is burned area over every year. Um, and so I, I put this up to focus on a little bit of nuance and point out that the increases in fire that we're observing are not incremental increases in fire, right? We're not seeing additional little bits more fire every year in this system, but rather we're seeing an increase in the extremes. So an increase in individual years with burned area estimates that are way beyond any historic norms. So I'm gonna focus a lot today on those extremes. This is a map of the interior of Alaska. So here's what those fires actually look like on the ground. This is fire perimeters from 1940 to 2016. You can see most of the interior has burned at least once in that time interval. Those are those patches in the blue. Some of those regions have burned twice. That's those patches in the purple. And some have now burned three times with again, this really short interval of 1940 to 2016. Um, so this is uh, another way of describing that we're seeing an increase in reburning or an increase in the interactions between fires across interior Alaska. Um, and this is, again, well outside of historic norms of that 100 to 200 year intervals between fires. Now we're starting to see places that are burning every 30 to 50 years. So again, rapid, rapid change. Um, another little piece of table setting, I'm going to situate us uh, in our geography for a second. This is again the interior of Alaska. When I say interior, I'm referring to the region in particular that's bordered by the Brooks Range up in the north and the Alaska Range down in the south. Uh, and when we talk about the different landscapes and the different forests in interior Alaska, we typically talk about uplands and lowlands. Um, this is a region dominated by conifer forests, um, but in, uh, in those conifer forests, you have upland conifer forests, which are generally pretty gently sloped. They tend to be really re well-drained, um, really productive forests. And then you have lowland conifer forests, which are flat. They tend to be more poorly drained, and they tend to be less productive. These are somewhat sort of arbitrary designations. These are very qualitative. These are just tools that we use to describe the landscapes that we see. Um, but they come into play in really interesting ways when we start to talk about the ways that fire is or is not occurring across these different types of forests. And so all of this increase in fire um, has some really critical ecological implications for the main species in this region. Um, I know I have a lot of tropical forest ecologists in the room right now. Um, this is not a system known for high diversity. Uh, there's maybe six native tree species in interior Alaska, so there's not a ton to keep track of. Um, but these two spruce species are the really important ones. Um, black spruce and white spruce have been dominant, the dominant trees in this region for probably the last 6,000 years, according to most pollen records from, from the paleoecology that's been done in this part of the world. And not only have they just been around for a long time, but they play this really important ecosystem role of um, maintaining carbon storage. So these are semi serotonous conifers. That means that they depend on fire to reproduce, but they don't require fire to reproduce. They have these cones that are sealed with wax. Um, and under the really high temperatures of fire, that wax melts, um, those cones drop seed, and these conifers reestablish over these really infrequent fire intervals. This means that they're associated with the greatest amounts of carbon storage out of any forest type in this particular region. So again, I've established that the boreal is this really key sink of carbon, um, and this is the forest type that enables that, not only through storing carbon in the biomass of the trees themselves, um, but these spruce forests are associated with really thick soil organic layers, really thick moss layers, um, and therefore very, very deep permafrost or frozen soil, soil that stays frozen year round and stores tremendous amounts of carbon. So spruce is often referred to as maintaining what we sometimes call an ecological legacy, importantly, across these infrequent fire intervals. And it does so via two specific mechanisms. One I've already sort of talked about. One is that aerial seed bank. So um, if a mature black spruce or white spruce forest burns, um, all of those trees will die, again, in these high severity infrequent events. 
the, the uh, wax in those cones will melt um, and you'll start to see an in, in input of all of these new little spruce seedlings and they'll reestablish and remain dominant across these infrequent um, and across these infrequent fires. They also help develop those thick soil organic layers that I mentioned a couple slides ago that tends to disfavor other deciduous species in the region. So they maintain this dominance again in our historic fire regime. And the, the key problem here that I've hopefully now I'm leading you to um, is that this cycle or this, this process takes about 50 years. So it can take 50 years for black or white spruce to reach full reproductive maturity, to have cones that can bear seeds that can actually reestablish under these fire intervals. Um, so an increase in the occurrence of fires that are occurring in 30 to 50 years um, has been set up as this really key, um, key disruptor to the system, right? A really key disturbance to this system. This is really well outside of historic norms. And so the expectation based on our knowledge of the ecosystem, based on um, what we understand about the mechanisms and the processes that are important is that reburning could overwhelm those legacy effects of spruce specifically by consuming seed bank and by consuming soil organic layers. So that's our sort of nugget of a research question. And I've, I've set the table and now I'm going to yank the tablecloth off and give you a little bit of a plot twist um, that happened to me as I was starting to work on this as a PhD student. So I'm gonna set the stage. Um, I'm a early PhD student at the University of Colorado. I've just started to work on this question. I'm really fired up about studying the impacts of reburning on forest structure and forest composition. And spoiler alert, I have finally set up some field sites where I can go measure those things out in Alaska. And I get to my field sites one summer and I see this. And this doesn't look like much, but this is a black spruce seedling that has been completely browsed by a herbivore. So it's really just this single stem. There's no branches left. There's a teeny bit of growth on the bottom, but it's just been decimated by a herbivore. And not only do I find this individual spruce, but I find entire fields of them. So these are um, all sorts of birch and spruce seedlings that have just been decimated by herbivores. Um, and a quick aside, if I had known that one, my picture was being taken or two, that I'd be using this picture in future talks, I would have tried to look more excited about what I was doing. Um, but that's me looking really, really, really excited about sampling all of these tiny, tiny saplings that have now been completely browsed. And this is where we get to the only one interactive point in the whole talk. Um, I've mentioned that this was browsed by a herbivore. Does anyone want to try to guess which herbivore? That's kind of what I thought. So moose. The answer for those of you online was moose. And again, it's a plot twist. It's not moose. It looks like it should be moose, right? It's quite tall. That's my shoe for reference. Um, but this is actually the height of the snowbank from the previous winter. So these are actually all browsed by snowshoe hair. Um, again, wild. So snow at this particular height means that hare were able to browse all of the regeneration of this particular site um, at that particular height, hitting black spruce, hitting these deciduous species that were coming back. And so here I was, this really early PhD student who was all fired up about studying forest carbon and forest composition, and I've now stumbled on this process that seems to really be influencing forest carbon and forest composition, and I've completely not taken it into account. So that's our curveball, um, and that leads us back into this diagram that I brought up right at the beginning of the talk, right? That there are, I think, a lot of ways for biotic disturbances like herbivores, like moose and hare, to interact with fire um, with potentially really interesting implications for composition and for carbon. And so I'm going to talk about a couple of specific arrows in this diagram. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three stories, um, three ways I've been thinking about these sorts of questions and the tools that I've used to address them. So the first story, I've sort of spoiled it already. Um, but I'm going to talk about the work that I've done trying to understand how fire, especially reburning, has impacted forest structure and forest composition. Then I'm going to talk about the impacts to forest carbon, and then we're going to get into the we're going to get back to the moose and back to the hares. So, starting with that first one, again, I've set up that there's this expectation. Um, when I started to work in this space, there was this expectation that reburning could overwhelm those legacy effects of spruce consuming seed bank and consuming soil organic layers. Um, but there were a couple of key knowledge gaps. One, there really wasn't very much empirical work on any of this. There were few to no studies, actual empirical studies of the effects of reburning or especially continued reburning. What happens when you not only have two fires in short intervals, but maybe three or more. Um, and the resiliency of lowlands really remained to be seen. So I, hadn't set the, I haven't set this up yet, but under this expectation, under this hypothesis, based on our knowledge of the system, 
it had been suggested that lowlands, because they're a little bit wetter, would be more resilient to this transformation. That the wetter soil moisture would mean less of that soil organic layer, or maybe less of that seed bank would be burned off in fire, and the spruce in those lowlands would be able to persist for longer, maintaining that carbon storage. So these were two really key gaps for which there were a lot of hypotheses and a lot of predictions, but not a ton of empirical data. Um, so that's the first question that I sought out to try to answer in, in my PhD. Essentially, how does reburning change forest composition and forest structure, um, particularly in uplands compared to lowlands? And so to sample this, I worked in two different locations in interior Alaska. Um, there could be an additional talk in this, working through how we selected these sites, how we determined places that had burned in these particular frequencies. Um, I won't get to that today, but I'm super happy to talk about it later if anyone's interested. It involved using a lot of remote sensing products and historic aerial imagery to find places that were black spruce or white spruce forests, but burned in these really extreme ways. And we ended up with two locations, um, one in an upland forest, again, a really productive, really dry forest, and one in a lowland forest, which was, again, wetter, um, slightly more poorly drained, it had permafrost closer to the surface, um, and was uh, generally less productive. Um, and so to sample, to actually collect data to test this expectation, um, we collected data on the overstory and the understory species within these particular forests. So things like species composition, how many trees are there, um, what they were, how well they were doing. And we did this in a network of plots that I established, about 50 plots, each of them about 20 by 20 meters, and all within this mosaic of overlapping fire perimeters. And so the quickest way to walk you through some of the results of this particular story is through some pictures. So um, I'm going to set this up. This is our reference plot. This is one of our mature, unburned black spruce forest sites that we sampled as a reference for what we'd expect um, most of our burned or reburned sites to look like. Um, I cored the trees in this particular stand and found out that most of these forests were somewhere between 86 to 100 years old. Again, that's very well in line with what we'd expect from our historic fire regime. So these are forests that in some ways are legacies of this historic pattern of fire. Um, they tend to be really dense. They tend to be evenly aged. All these trees grew up after that last fire 100 years ago. And they tend to have really thick soil organic layers and thick moss layers. Um, and aside, I know these trees look probably unimaginably un unimpressive to the tropical forest ecologists in the region. This is just, again, a general reminder that due to how cold it is up here, um, growth and productivity are quite different. And so even though these, these trees look teeny, teeny, tiny, a lot of them can actually be about 100, 150 years old. Um, for contrast, this is one of our sites that's burned one time. So this was a black spruce forest prior to burning in 2004. Um, you can see a lot of that standing um, spruce still left in the plot, um, but it's been killed off in that fire as, or has fallen down as a snag. Um, here's a bit of a spoiler alert. There's not really any, there's a mix of spruce and deciduous seedlings coming in in the understory. You can see some spruce, some birch there in particular. In contrast, this is one of our locations that's reburned, where it's been burned twice. Again, this was a black spruce forest prior to burning in 1967 and in 2004. And you can see already visually, it's strikingly different from either the once burned forest or the unburned forest. Um, those black standing dead black spruce have now, or some of them are still standing, but many have fallen or have even been consumed in that second fire. Um, it's the regeneration is dominated by deciduous species. You have birch and aspen and willow coming in in, in big clumps. Um, and for those of you eagle eyed, I hope the resolution isn't too bad on this. Um, there are conifer seedlings, but they're mostly ones that have been killed off in that second fire. So this would have this would have been a conifer seedling that would have established after 1967, but then been killed off in 2004. And then finally, in contrast to that, this is one of our sites that's been burned, been reburned twice, or has been burned three times in short intervals. Um, so drastically, drastically different already. Um, so this again would have been black spruce prior to burning in 1957, in 1974, and in 2004. Um, and so you can see there's nearly no black spruce left. There's a few that are sort of fallen that have somehow slipped through the cracks of those fires. Um, there's few to no conifer seedlings left on this plot. And you'll notice that visually it's really open, um, but there's a lot of regeneration happening of birch and aspen and willow in these sort of really shrubby clumps. And I'll talk about this clumps more in a second. Um, so already 
a really striking transformation. And another place to point out that the most recent fire in all of these burn plots was 2004 and I think 2005 in some of those locations, which means that they're all theoretically in the same stage of regeneration. They're all the same age. Um, so they should be recovering in sort of similar ways. And so the differences that we see in forest structure and forest composition are really striking. So I'm gonna back that up with some numbers. Um, this is the proportion of species present on different plots in our upland location and our lowland location. Um, black spruce is here in the red. You have some willow in both spots and you have some birch in the uplands, which is pretty common even for mature forests. Um, so here's our once burn site. You can see compared to our mature stands, already less spruce present in both locations, um, much more birch and much more willow in both and just a lot more variability. Contrast that with our sites that have burned twice. Again, spruce is now, by majority, not the most dominant species present anymore. You have really great abundances of willow, um, some aspen in both locations, especially birch in the upland. And then again, in contrast, here's our sites that have burned three times, little to no spruce left on plots. Um, birch and willow now most present in the uplands, and aspen and willow most present in the lowlands. So two key takeaways. One, there's less spruce in any of these burned or reburned plots, even in those lowlands. Remember, those lowlands have been hypothesized to be more resilient to this, right? Because they have wetter soil moisture. The thought was potentially less of the soil and less of the seeds will get burnt off in those fires. Maybe the fires will, won't be as high severity in those locations. Um, but that really doesn't seem to be the case. And the other key takeaway is that deciduous trees seem to dominate both locations, but the particular species are really different between the upland and the lowland. So I've set up this shift in forest composition. And so here's the corresponding shift in forest structure. Um, there's some interesting shifts in density. So this is the tree counts per meter. So that just the trees per square meter um, in both of these locations. And you'll notice a ton of variability introduced by reburning. Um, in most cases, there's actually more trees per square meter than those unburned sites, even in those really dense mature stands that I showed earlier. Um, part of that is these deciduous species that are coming in are coming in, the, in these really dense sort of clumps of willow. So it's a weird sort of dynamic where the, the forest structure itself is much more physically open, but there's more trees growing back. And so a couple of key takeaways from this first piece. Again, that transition from conifer to deciduous does seem to be solidified with reburning. This does hold up to a lot of the expectations we had about the system, um, but that transition does take place even in those potentially more resilient lowlands, at least in these sites. Um, if you're interested in this work, um, this was published in Ecosphere in 2021. You can go read much more in detail about a lot of this. Um, and this left me with a couple of really key questions and key next steps. Um, the first one is that the scale of this transformation is a bit unclear, right? This is one of the main limitations of these sorts of field-based approaches is that I can make a lot of conclusions about the dynamics at this particular or these particular sites, but it's hard to know how widespread or how common this might be across interior Alaska and much wider spaces. Um, and then the implications for carbon storage are also unclear just from this alone. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about next, almost like I set up that transition on purpose. Um, so we've talked about the first story, which is that increasing fires do drive this shift in forest structure and forest composition. And now we're gonna work, walk through um, the work we've done to try to understand how that shifts, how that corresponds to shifts in forest carbon. And so we also have some expectations going into this about the impact of fire on carbon in this system. Um, this is a, a really important paper from Science in 2021 that found that carbon in these faster growing deciduous forests at least on these tiny, uh, on these shorter timescales of 10 to 20 years, seem to compensate for any soil carbon losses. Um, so you obviously lose soil carbon after a fire; it's burnt off um, in the organic layer and sometimes in the mineral soil. Um, but this study found that after single or sometimes a couple of reburns, um, that these deciduous species that were coming in because they grow in so densely in these big clumps and because they are faster growing than spruce, that they were offsetting that carbon loss. So this was a really um, sort of exciting outcome and, and exciting piece of research to suggest that actually um, we might be able to recover from some of this loss in carbon storage after fire. And they found again, specifically that this occurred because of these increases in the density of deciduous species and the growth of deciduous species. Um, and so this was the key expectation and this was our key question was how does reburning change forest carbon, right? This study or these studies were mostly from um, single burns or single reburns. Um, and then are those changes modified by the changes we're observing in forest composition and forest structure? Um, 
So similar field methods as before, um, we, to evaluate this question of how does reburning change forest carbon, we measured above ground biomass. We also measured a bunch of other pools of carbon on the landscape. So things like coarse woody debris, we harvested litter, we took soil cores to measure soil carbon. Um, for the soil scientists in the room, we measured the first 15 centimeters. So lots of surface carbon. Um, we didn't go terribly deep. So one a really critical pool of carbon that's missing from this particular study um, and missing from many of these field studies is permafrost, right? Which stores the vast amount of carbon um, underneath, underneath these forests. And then the other main approach was to try to evaluate how these changes um, were modified or mediated by the corresponding changes in forest carbon composition and forest structure. And so the main approach for this was using a Bayesian hierarchical model um, based on the idea that fire would be the main driver of carbon in these sites, right? Fire, fire would have the largest effect size on carbon, but there might be additional variation in carbon and in, bi in, in, in biomass driven by the specific shifts we were seeing in composition and structure. And so a Bayesian model is a really great way to partition out that variance and talk about those smaller effects on the edges. Um, this is total carbon across pools and fire history. Um, and I'm, I've hidden the rest of the graph for now to just make the point that compared to the unburned sites, obviously there's a lot less carbon in these burned and reburned sites, right? These unburned sites, as I set up, are about 100 years old. Everything else is now about 20 years old. So we wouldn't necessarily expect them to be one-to-one. -one. Um, but we do see a decline in total carbon with reburning, um, maybe somewhat intuitively, right? Because we're seeing fewer we're seeing um, more carbon consumed in these particular pools. But the, the conversation about pools is also a really important one. Um, there were differences in the ways carbon was stored in lowland and upland locations, a little bit in line with expectations. So most of the carbon in lowlands was stored in soil, um, and most of the carbon stored in uplands was stored in overstory biomass. That corresponds pretty well with the expectation that uplands are really productive, lowlands are less productive, more wet. Um, and those changes carry through each of these particular reburn histories. I'm not gonna go over this in detail because I'm gonna talk more high level today, but I do wanna take a second to point out that um, if you focus your attention on a second for the, on, on the story that's happening in soil, especially in the lowlands, you'll notice that on average, soil carbon actually was higher in sites that had burned twice than in sites that had burned once. Um, this might be because of the input of pyrogenic carbon or charcoal into the system, which actually adds carbon into soil. Um, but there might be some critical threshold in which a third fire erases that addition or combusts that addition. Um, so lots of really interesting smaller scale dynamics in here, but I want to focus today on um, the results from the Bayesian models, which again was a, a way of getting at this question of are those changes modified by the changes that we see in forest structure and forest composition? Um, these are posterior density distributions. Um, that's very wordy. These are the probability distributions of the different coefficients of the model. So we've partitioned out the variance explained by fire or the effect of fire on carbon. And now we're just looking for the effects of deciduous density, deciduous basal area, uh, or deciduous growth, and then soil organic layer. And you'll notice that in almost every case, those effect sizes are centered around zero meaning there's not really an effect of deciduous density on biomass, or not a strong one suggested by the data that we collected. There's not a strong imp impact, um, especially on soil of things like soil organic layer. And there's a slightly positive effect of basal area. Um, but again, that probability distribution is really well overlapping zero. So another way of saying this is that the differences in carbon seem to be driven, if anything, maybe by soil organic layer, but they don't seem to be driven by that deciduous regeneration. Um, so another way of saying this is the carbon in these reburn sites is most strongly impacted by fire, and this mechanism of faster growing deciduous species offsetting losses in soil carbon doesn't seem to hold true when fires continue. So in these reburn sites under these timescales, it doesn't appear that there's that offset is able to sort of withstand the ultimate losses in soil carbon from continued reburning and continued combustion of soil. So um, this work is in review right now uh, in global change biology, but fingers crossed, because I'd love to be able to share this more widely. Uh, and this also had a really key question come out of this, which is how will this trend continue to play out, right? These sites are about 15 to 20 years old. This is really early in terms of time scale. It's hard to know how carbon will continue or not continue to reaccumulate and recover in these particular sites. Um, and if it sounds like I'm leading towards maybe a methods shift, it's because I am. Um, I'm going to talk now about the shift I made from the PhD into the postdoc to use some different tools um, to try to, again, 
overcome some of the limitations, but also some of the strengths of this field-based approach. So key findings, we're seeing this shift in forest structure and forest composition. Um, frequent fire does seem to actually overcome this, this sort of input of deciduous biomass via these losses in soil carbon. Um, and now the question is, how do fire and herbivores interact to change these forests? So we're going to go back to herbivores for a second. Um, and I have to do a little bit more work setting up the expectations for this particular piece, because in part because there weren't a ton going into this. There's not a ton of focus on biotic disturbances in many systems, and especially in this system, and definitely not in the context of interactions with climate change and interactions with other um, abiotic disturbances. So we knew, or, or we've set up that this increase in fire is leading to this greater deciduous dominance across the landscape. Um, we also know that the existing biotic agents that are in this part of the world, moose and hare primarily, they do target deciduous species. So they prefer these deciduous species for forage. And so the key question became, how will these biotic disturbances interact with fire, specifically via these changes in composition and carbon, um, maybe to alter either fire or carbon? Um, and so I'm going to walk through, again, a little bit of table setting. There's a couple of really important primary biotic disturbance agents in Alaska that I want to talk about. We've talked about the first two, um, which are herbivores. So we have moose and we have snowshoe hare. I couldn't find a great hare picture, so that's what we went with. Um, and I'm introducing these in the order of things that we know the most about to then talking about the things we know sort of the least about. And so we, we have a ton of really excellent data on things like moose and hare. There's been a, a ton of really amazing wildlife ecology work on these two particular species in Alaska. We know how they move. We know their population sizes pretty well. We know their preferred forage. We know what they eat, where they live, where they reproduce. Um, and there are a lot of biotic agents for which we don't have that form of information, in part because they are really new introductions to this system. So there's two primary insect disturbances in this particular system. Again, pretty recent and pretty new, um, and also expanding with climate change. So there's a lot of question marks around things like spruce budworm and aspen leaf liner. We know they have really important, um, they're a really por important form of mortality for some of these tree species, um, but some of, it, some of them are moving further north. Some of their uh, impacts seem to be really changing with climate. And then there's some novel emerging pathogens as well. Um, aspen canker in particular is a fungi that was identified about 10 years ago in this system. It's completely new otherwise to this system. It has really severe mortality um, and severity to aspen, but we don't have a great even sense of how well it's distributed, how well it's moving, how it's dispersed, et cetera, et cetera. So some really interesting um, changes to the, the dynamics of biotic disturbances in this particular system. Again, similar to the changes that we're seeing in fire, right? Climate is, I said at the beginning, altering the frequency, the severity, and the extent of disturbances, and biotic disturbances are not an exception. So I had this moment at the in, in my PhD where I had this whole other piece of the puzzle that I was missing when trying to talk through how these forests were changing under climate change in the context of disturbances. And I found myself thinking through the ways in which um, the sampling that I've been doing, which was mostly field-based sampling, was really critical and was really a powerful way of testing some of the expectations, but also had a lot of limitations. And so one of the solutions to that limitations is switching to a more process-based modeling approach. Um, process-based models are a really powerful way of testing expectations in systems where um, maybe expectations are changing even beyond previous historic norms. Um, the tool that I use in particular in my work here at Cary is Island, which is a landscape model developed to simulate uh, forest growth. It simulates individual trees over time. They have their own growth and mortality, um, and you can set them on fire and introduce moose to, to eat them. Uh, that's not the scientific way to say it, but um, Island interfaces really well with a newly developed tool for modeling biotic disturbances, which is called BITE. Um, you can see they really wanted to land on that particular acronym, and I'm, I'm so glad they did because it's very catchy. Um, BITE is a really powerful tool of describing biotic agents in a modeling framework. Um, it's pretty new to the scene. Again, this is a really new approach. There's not been a ton of um, modeling of biotic disturbances in general, much less in, con in combination or in interaction with other disturbances. Um, and I wanted to talk through briefly some of the ways in which um, the, the sausage gets made, because I think it's a, a cool way of talking through how we're trying to understand these emerging biotic disturbance uh, impacts. So in a landscape model, um, you can pair it with something like bite. Uh, it'll feed that landscape model uh, information on the host dynamics, right? Which 
host trees are where, how many of them are, what the environment looks like. And you as the user can then um, parameterize your biotic agent model using all sorts of existing information. So you can feed it information on potential habitat, talk about how you'd expect that agent to get introduced or dispersed throughout the landscape, how it colonizes new forests and new habitats, um, how, it pop how its populations dynamics change over time, and then what impact it has ultimately on the landscape itself. You'll notice there's a lot of pieces in here, and I just set up that there's a variety of different biotic disturbances in Alaska, and they occur on a spectrum from things for which we have a ton of information and things for which we have very little information. So my approach for the last year has been to parameterize bite in particular for moose and hare species in Alaska for which we have a lot of information on these particular dynamics, right? We understand pretty well um, how far a moose can travel in a day and how much it eats over a year. Um, but we also have these new emerging disturbances for which we don't really have a sense of how they're introduced, how they colonize, how they move, and then what their impact is on the landscape. Um, so this is a really powerful tool that you can customize based on the amount of data actually available. Um, and that's been a lot of the scope of my project here at Cary has been working with that really limited data to try to model what we can to understand or anticipate this change. Um, so I also wanted to include this uh, to point out again, to get into the weeds a little bit on this landscape modeling, one of the really powerful tools is you can take um, all of this existing information and expectations you have about your system, all of the knowledge you have about the different processes and the different um, the different pieces of your ecosystem, and you can break it down. So I can take our knowledge about the boreal and how boreal forests regrow and how they change over time. Um, here's my little mock boreal forest. This is permafrost, meant to be permafrost underneath. And you can build a modeled landscape um, for which you can simulate all these different disturbances. So the, the landscape that I work with right now is about 60,000 square hectares. Um, and now I can add in fire and I can track things. So I can track how these forests change over time. I can track how soil changes over time, how permafrost, how the carbon and permafrost changes over time um, across this landscape and under these dynamics of fire um, that I've set in accordance with expectations for the system. In addition, now you can add in herbivores, which is a really exciting feature. Um, and so another strength to this approach is you can isolate individual processes, right? So I can test these ideas about how biotic agents and fire interact in a way I wouldn't be able to do in the field, right? I can't remove fire from the equation in the field and just watch what happens, but I can do it in a model. Um, and so I'm gonna talk through some of the really exciting preliminary results that we have of doing just that with Island. Um, this is the study design for testing some of these ideas of those herbivore fire interactions um, is designing these landscapes that are about 60,000 hectares, again, that represent a real landscape in Alaska, and then running simulations with fire, um, without fire, with moose, with hare, with both of them combined, and then without either, and tracking the corresponding changes in biomass and in forest composition. Um, and then you can use the difference in those dependent variables between all those different scenarios um, to, to gain insight about the interaction effects. Um, another note, this is not something I'm gonna talk about today, but again, would be super happy to chat about this over lunch if people are interested. Um, the ultimate goal with this project is then to also vary this entire framework by different climate scenarios, right? So to test the role of how different expectations about climate might alter some of these particular dynamics or these particular interactions. Um, so this is one of our initial landscapes. This is um, the landscape I've been working with. This is based off of um, the Caribou P Poker Creek watershed in interior Alaska. Um, and you'll notice it's a really big mix of different forest types like I've talked about. There's a lot of spruce, a lot of black and white spruce in particular. You have some birch stands and some aspen stands dispersed throughout it. Um, and so for to test, start to test these ideas of how biotic disturbances and fire were interacting, um, I parameterize moose and hare based on a lot of existing data. Again, I won't spend a ton of time talking about this, but if you want to ask me how much a moose eats in a given year, I could probably look it up because I had to look it up this year for this, which was really cool. Um, and so here's some really exciting preliminary results. So asking a very fundamental fundamental question here, how does browsing alter forest carbon and composition? This is biomass of the four main primary species in this particular landscape um, under two different simulations, under a simulation that includes browsing and under a simulation that magically includes no browsing, 
And so you can see biomass over time declines over the length of the simulation. This is a simulation of about 100 years. Um, you can see white spruce generally increases in biomass, and you see declines in aspen and in birch in this particular simulation. Um, but the browsing simulation is the solid line, and the no browsing is this dotted line. And so one really fascinating idea here was that in some cases, um, the moose and the hare are, they're set to browse um, aspen, birch, and white spruce. And so, for example, in this aspen curve, you can see there's less biomass in the simulation with browsing, but it's not a tremendously big difference. And also, maybe more importantly, it doesn't seem to strongly alter the overall trends that we see, right? We're not seeing big shifts in composition driven by browsing, at least under the current parameters. Um, so this is really fascinating. And this suggests that if you keep that picture of my field sites in the back of your head, maybe the, those herbivores have really important local impacts, but they don't, at least in this simulation, don't seem to scale up. Um, another way of thinking about that interaction is to, to think about what about in the absence of fire? So again, one of the strengths of this model-based approach is you can just turn off fire in a way that as much as it would be maybe convenient to do that for our purposes in real life, that's not gonna happen. Um, and so this is the same graph. These are, um, this is birch, or white spruce, excuse me, birch down here, aspen over here. This is a simulation with fire. This is a simulation with no fire. And both of these simulations have browsing in them. And you'll notice that again, biomass is not drastically different regardless of fire, which means that fire is not necessarily um, freeing up any more forage um, that, that the herbivores are then taking advantage of. Um, so a couple of really key next steps. Um, there's a lot to, to expand on this. And, and as you can imagine, there's a lot of sort of follow-up questions to this. A couple of big ones that I wanted to mention for now um, is I think, again, a, a really powerful tool in this approach is you can determine a lot of thresholds for effects. So right now, it doesn't seem like the, the moose or the hare in particular have this sort of important effect on biomass or in forest composition. Um, but with a modeling approach, I can really bump up the amount of, I could throw down a million moose on this landscape and see, see if that I can see if there's any sort of threshold effects for which they do have important effects on forest composition and forest carbon. And another key question is how does this scale, right? A 60,000 hectare landscape feels computationally like a lot, but is a really, really small piece of this much broader landscape of the interior of Alaska. Um, so I'm gonna bring us back um, out of this, out of the weeds a little bit, pun intended, and focus back on some of, I think the really key exciting bits of this research, which is, First and foremost, the finding that these increased fires do shift forest composition and forest structure, um, that they're shifting forest carbon, and that there's a lot more work to do to try to understand whether fire and herbivores are in fact interacting um, either through these through these inputs or to, to those inputs. Um, and I wanna plug two sort of big future questions and future directions for this work. Um, one is the plan is to now go on and try to parameterize for these other biotic disturbance agents for the insects and the pathogens that I mentioned at the beginning of, the uh, of this particular talk, um, for which we have less and less data. So there's a lot of sort of exciting work we'll, we'll have to do to try to figure out how to model these things for which we don't have a ton of um, existing expectations. Uh, and then as I hinted, how does fire alter that biotic fire interaction um, and does it in fact alter their effect on carbon? So potentially maybe these biotic disturbance agents do in fact have important carbon implications, but only under warmer temperatures. Um, so a lot to be done, which is very exciting. And I wanna bring us back to this initial picture and I emphasize again, I've set up that the boreal is this really, I think, important piece of the puzzle when talking about climate and when talking about carbon. Uh, and if I leave you with a takeaway, I hope it's this, that answering questions about future change, particularly in the boreal, um, the, if the boreal is sort of a vast ecosystem, then responding to these really broad array of research questions requires a vast set of tools and of disciplines. Um, so super excited to take any questions and any comments. Um, and with that, I will thank my co-authors and thank you for your time. We have plenty of time for questions, so let's start with the in-person audience.
That's a super great question. I was told if I don't repeat the questions for people on Zoom, I don't get pizza for lunch afterwards. So I'm going to try to really hold to that. Um, the question was, what are the key difference? Are there key differences in foraging preferences of things like moose and hare? What are they? How do they correspond? That's an excellent question. Thank you for, for bringing that up because that was absolutely something that I actually meant to say, but didn't. Um, as you can imagine, um, moose and hare do have very different browsing approaches, just physically, right? Partly because of um, their height differences. And so they tend to target um, different growth forms. Uh, they tend to mostly both still target deciduous species. They both go for uh, birch and aspen, um, but Hare are more commonly found to be browsing on things like white spruce and, and even black spruce seedlings on occasion. Um, and so their impacts are slightly different or could be slightly different. And I think one key question that I, I still am trying to puzzle through in the context of this work is whether that will scale up to be important in the context of the modeling work. Right. I think it can be really important at a at a site scale, um, but whether or not you see those differences in browsing and browsing impact across um, maybe a, a, a landscape of 100 years, I'm not I'm not sure whether that'll carry through, which is a kind of a really interesting piece of this. Uh, Jane. Okay, so a couple of questions, and if I miss one, call me out or take away my pizza or something. But one key question was, um, oh, I've already blanked. <laughs> so sorry. Herbar oh yeah, are there herbivores below ground that are an important role in this? And then the other question was, um, have you looked at the different forms of carbon in these particular pools? Um, so I can, this for people maybe who don't know Jane and Jane's really impressive work on microbes. Um, I'm sure there are, I haven't been able to sort of piece my brain around that. I'm sure there are ways in which the below ground processes here have, scale up to have important carbon implications. Um, but to my knowledge, there haven't, there just really hasn't been a ton of work done in that space at all, really, especially, especially in the boreal, right? I'm sure there's ways in which that, um, that would be a really important herbivore that's just not at all in the conversation. So I will say completely, completely unknown, defer to you if you have any insights on that. Um, and then the other question about the forms of carbon, um, a little bit is the short answer. Um, oh, my Siri is trying to answer the question for me. Um, uh, we did some work trying to understand, especially the input of that pyrogenic carbon. That was a really exciting piece of that work. And that was driven mostly by seeing that box pop, pop up in the, in the graph where we saw inputs to soil carbon. And we were trying to figure out where those came, came from. Um, we found just proportionately slightly more pyrogenic carbon. Um, but that's such a sort of messy approach. And all you really end up with is, is just the amount of, carbon, of pyrogenic carbon across these pools. Um, so I'm sure there's more nuance there as well. Uh, Ian. That's one of the really big million dollar questions in this space. Oh, and the question was, um, it seems as though those semi serotonous cones would be really dispersal limited. Um, so if you have enough fires over time uh, and the fire perimeters are large enough, is are they permanently extirpated from a particular region? Do they come back in after longer time scales? Um, and so that gets at this question that has really been circulating a lot in this region of um, regeneration failure, right? That's, I think, a term thrown around a lot in, in fire re recently. The idea that there could be so much fire um, that conifer species cannot regenerate at all. And there's nothing in the, in the region or in the area that could help them regenerate. And so the question with black spruce um, is still out there, right? We actually, we don't really know how long it takes for them to repopulate from outside a fire perimeter and for them to get back in. 
And part of the ways in which deciduous species seem to be outcompeting them, particularly in reburns, is that these deciduous species are more often to be wind dispersed. And so they can disperse in from outside these fire perimeters and arrive there much more quickly than these black spruce, which take generations to then repopulate. Um, so the 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 answer, the short answer to that is basically jury is still out, but I think that's a really exciting element of this. Yeah. So let's do one more in person, then yeah. we'll do a couple um, from our outside visitors. Perfect. Um, you've been waving. Thank you. <laughs> the question is what I think about the continued utility of the phrase fire regime, um, which I think is an excellent question. I would say, I, I, I don't know how much of this came through in the talk, but my background is in paleoecology. Um, and so my thinking tends to skew towards those longer timeframes. And I think in the context of longer timeframes, functionally, that's sort of the best way we have to describe patterns of fire over time and to differentiate between this is a pattern that we used to observe and this is a pattern we observe now. Um, I think the word regime in there seems like it carries a lot of weight maybe that could we could talk more about, right? Um, but in terms of just the functionality of describing this is the way that fire used to occur across the landscape and this is how it does now, um, I'm not sure we have a, a better alternative. So a question from our virtual audience. With the increase in temperature, have you started seeing an increase in the diversity of tree species in the forest? And in the future, what are the ramifications for that? Also excellent question. Um, there have been some really exciting pieces of work that have come out recently looking at the expansion of lodgepole pine in interior Alaska which is all to say that there's been a ton of work to try to understand how different species might move into this system, whether it might um, change the way that we are understanding fire and the, under the way that we understand forests in this system if there were other species that were to occur here. Um, species like lodgepole pine are common in, in Canada and other parts of the boreal, and they just haven't really made it up the in to the interior yet. And there's still a lot of questions about why and what those limits are and whether or not it's just sort of stochastic. And if they just make it up there, then they'll, they'll populate and, and be important. Um, one of the ways in which a species like lodgepole pine has been talked about as being a, an important piece of this puzzle is it's a conifer that can deal with much more frequent fire. Um, so it doesn't require those 50 year fire free intervals to grow back. And so there could be a world in which there's a lot more fire in the boreal, but it remains a conifer dominated system if there's this expansion of other species. Um, but that's all to say that it's a, I think, a fascinating chain, a fascinating conversation about change because it's um, in some ways the the metaphor about uh, there's a metaphor about a boat, right? Where if you rebuild a boat and you rebuild every single plank in the boat, is it the same boat? And I think that terrible metaphor, which has a much more elegant uh, way of describing it, holds true in the boreal as well. Which is if you completely replace boreal forests in interior Alaska with other species. Is it the same system? Is that an alternative system? I don't think we have great answers to that, but I think it's a really fun way to think about it. Okay, the next one is from Vicki Kelly. Are deciduous species less flammable than conifers? And if so, do you expect decreased fire frequency if there's a shift to more deciduous species? This is, I'm getting amazing questions also, so thank you all for this. Um, Deciduous species historically have been considered less flammable because they have higher foliage moisture. They just have wetter leaves than the, the um, needles in these spruce trees. Whether or not that persists is also, I think, up for debate. Um, so we're seeing more and more of these really dry, extreme fire seasons. And in those dry, extreme fire seasons, anecdotally, there's been folks who have said that these deciduous forests are burning at the same frequency as these spruce forests. Um, so historically, these deciduous forests were even really actively relied on by managers as fuel breaks um, and as a way of managing and containing fire. But it, it seems like under the right conditions, they might be able to burn at the same frequency. Um, and so whether or not that threshold effect or that, that limitation will persist is, I think, a really important um, unresolved piece of this. Was, that, there was, a, was there a second half of that? Nope, that was, okay. that was it. Perfect. And then one more from the, the virtual audience. So Rick Osfeld asks, Snowshoe hares are notorious for their 10-year cycles in abundance, varying about an order of magnitude. Did you simulate those dynamics or only the mean? 
And if the mean, do you think that there are scenarios under which decadal pulses in hair herbivory have a different impact, especially if peaks predictably follow fire? Also an amazing question. Um, this was, and I, I don't mean to do this as a pun, but this was absolutely a rabbit hole I went down um, when trying to parameterize for hair. Um, is they do they do persist on these really extreme cycles. There's sort of the textbook example of a population cycle that occurs in 10 years. And trying to think through whether that was primarily driven by forage, by, by the host biomass and the host species that were available for them, or whether that's also driven by predators or whether that's climate or fire is an enormous puzzle of this that I, I don't think is in the scope of this particular project, but is just waiting for somebody to come tackle it. Um, so they... So the short answer is that they don't occur in these cycles explicitly now um, in the model. I think I'd love to incorporate a little bit of that in the future, um, but that gets into a really thorny question of, um, do you simulate predators to eat the hairs so that the hairs occur on those cycles? So then they are, are representing sort of the dynamics in real life, um, which again is I think really important and useful, but in the scope of um, something where right now they don't seem to scale up to have terribly important impacts, even at just an average population. I'm not convinced that simulating those peaks in population on their own um, is worth the sort of mess it would take to get into it. But that's all to say, fascinating research question, um, probably not in the scope of this. Let's do one to two more from the, the in-person audience here, and then we can wrap up. Uh, Evan. The question is, how do you validate the results that you're seeing, especially in browsing? So if, if we're not seeing as much of an effect, how can you check how closely that reflects reality? Um, and are there studies and ways to do that? And the, the short answer is yes. And that's been really exciting is there's a ton of exposure work um, in, in Alaska, but across the boreal more generally. Um, so people building big fences and structures to try to keep these herbivores out and then monitor over time how the forest responds. Um, that was honestly, originally as a PhD student, that was sort of my inclination for answering a question like this as well, right? To keep them out and to monitor what happens. And the challenge of that, with that, of course, is just how long it takes to track those changes. Um, and so there are some really great studies exclu excluding especially moose and hare individually. I've been told anecdotally that the challenge is it's really hard to build a fence to keep them both out at the same time, which is wild to me. Um, but there's ways of, of checking that those biomass decreases that we see correspond to what we see in real life. And we can do it by looking at how much biomass is actually getting removed, how canopy height is or isn't getting suppressed. We can track all these different variables. And like you said, try to benchmark against some, some real data. So a lot of that work is ongoing, which has been cool. One more question. Kathy. Mm. Sure. The question was about the philosophy of using these hundred year predictions, right? Whether they can be useful, whether there's um, how, how to use them in ways that are useful, because theoretically, right, we might expect completely unprecedented future change after that 100 years. Um, and then the other piece was about whether there's a goal to put these other pests and pathogens in there in here as well. Did, did I catch all of that? Yeah. Okay. Totally. Totally. So um, the the short answer to the to that question is absolutely the goal is to have all of these different biotic disturbances in here. Ultimately, it'd be great to be able to compare um, the scale of biotic and abiotic disturbances across the boreal with a tool like this, because um, we can get at that scale where that's obviously much harder to do um, using even just all of the available field data that's out there. The trickier and thornier question about philosophy is, I think, a really fascinating one, right? That 
yes, absolutely. In theory, after this 100 years, a lot of our expectations about the system may not hold true. And I think the kind of interesting piece that I come to with this is that already the expectations that we have about the system aren't necessarily holding true, right? We've had this expectation about um, successional pathways of black spruce, and it's been very definitive for a very long time. And, and um, that's already starting to shift and the, the system's already starting to change in really unprecedented ways. Uh, the question about flammability brings that up as well, right? That um, it's been expected that um, if deciduous species are less flammable, there might even be this negative feedback to fire where there's more deciduous across the landscape, but then there's less fire. So then eventually the spruce come back in and eventually this whole, whole thing gets sort of tampered down. And a lot of those expectations are, are really well informed by these existing paleoecological records. Um, and the question is, how far have we departed um, from those norms and, and how useful it is? And I, I don't know that I have a clean, easy answer to that, but I think it's fascinating. Um, and I, I do, I'll say too, with this work in particular, for example, this simulation is just under um, what we'd consider baseline climate. So this doesn't actually include climate change explicitly in this particular simulation. So, so much of this is really theoretical right now, right? In theory, can herbivores have an impact on carbon? Um, the goal is, especially with this project, is not to necessarily say there will be this many moose in year 75 from now eating this much carbon, but rather what are, can, is this, is there, um, at least if we, based on our knowledge of the ecosystem, are there ways in which this can transpire in sort of a perfect storm to have impacts on carbon? Um, or is there just not, is this just not sort of biologically relevant? Does that make sense? Wonderful. Thanks so much, Kate. Great talk. Um, for those of you who are here in person, remember there is pizza in the lunchroom starting now. And uh, let's give Kate a final round of applause. Thanks, everybody.